to the room. Every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. Sing, we love you. We love you, and we'll never stop. Can't live without you, Jesus. We love you, and we can't get enough. All this is for you, Jesus. you walk into the room, sickness starts to vanish, every hopeless situation ceases to exist. When you walk into the room, the dead begin to rise, cause there's a resurrection life in all you do. going to ask that you be seated, and I want us to go into prayer for those who are being affected by the hurricane right now. So Heavenly Father, we know that there are, um, there are places in Florida where there are not people in houses of worship this morning because of the devastation that is happening there, and we have friends and family and missionaries and people that we know of, Lord, that are in the thick of it right now. And we just continue to pray for their safety and their protection. Lord, thank you for some of the news coming back already this morning of provisions that have been made for them um, uh, to be in a safe place and to have food and shelter and, and also other people around them, Lord Jesus. So we thank you for that. But we pray for your hand of protection upon them over these next couple of days and as it travels across part of our country. Lord, um, help us as churches and as family and friends, Lord, to be able to step up and to uh, step into the place of helping these who are going to need help with their homes and places to stay. And uh, we pray for all of those 
emergency personnel and the police and everyone who, um, the guard who will come into those places and give order and help things to get done quickly, Lord. I pray your hands upon all of those who are workers of you, Lord, for just times like these. And um, Lord, again, your hand upon them. We thank you, Lord, that we have a God that we can, that we can call out to and a God that gives us strength in, in the hardest times. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Children are dismissed to children's church. They can make their way that way. How about deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. What was that little thing you did right there? Oh, right there. <laughs> well, for our passage of Scripture this morning, we are in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, 15 through 22. The title of the sermon is From John to Jesus, From John to Jesus. If you could turn my microphone down just a little bit, that would be great. Thank you. Um, what we're going to see in this passage of Scripture this morning is that Luke is going to transition from John the Baptist to Jesus very quickly. He wants to make this transition so that our eyes get focused now on Jesus. Um, but just a bit of review, we go back to the word repentance, a return to repentance, because we were told uh, by John the Baptist, that's his message, repent and be baptized. And we learned last week that the baptism that he did was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So I thought I would go back to that and say, what does real repentance look like? What's real repentance look like? So I got six things here pretty quickly. The first thing is, you call it sin. Real repentance, you call it sin. You don't call it a mistake. You don't call it a boo-boo. You don't call it an accident. You call it sin. And the, the second thing is you acknowledge God's wrath. You realize there are consequences to sin, that there, it, it might feel like punishment, but it is disciplined, and you shouldn't be uh, surprised when it comes upon you. The third thing is that you abandon religious rituals. That you just don't walk through the motions with this thing if it's true repentance. If it's true repentance, actually, you won't care about your reputation anymore. All you, care, you won't care about what other people think. All you'll care about is what God thinks about this, and you will act upon that. The fourth thing is, you don't play the excuse card when there's real repentance. You, you don't uh, rationalize it away. You don't make qualifiers. You don't say, well, it's not as bad as so-and-so did. Kind of thing. That's not part of real repentance. Number five is you start bearing godly fruit. If it's true repentance, as soon as you get up and you're starting to make things right, and there's godly fruit that's going to come from that. And number six is you accept God's will, that you get up from there and you've got a new direction in which you are going and you are going to follow that direction because that's what it says in God's word. That's true repentance. And so last week we learned that John the Baptist's baptism was a baptism of repentance. We talked about believer's baptism. That's when um, you come to Christ and you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's a time for you to say, confess, Jesus is Lord. Um, but the baptism of repentance that John is talking about here is when people would come to him and confess their sins and, and, and he would baptize them and say, you are forgiven. By God's word, you are forgiven. And uh, it's interesting that we see it again. Oh, go back. We see it again in Acts 19. Paul makes a mention of this. Paul is in the city of Ephesus. He comes across some disciples, 12 of them actually, of John the Baptist. And, and he asks them the question, do you know the Holy Spirit? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And their answer to it was, who's the Holy Spirit? <laughs> they, like they didn't even know. They didn't know. So they must have gotten baptized by John the Baptist and then went off and never came in contact with Jesus or anything like that. And so Paul says to them, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. There it is again. Telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him. That is in Jesus. So there we see it again. 
So let's go to verse 15. Here's the start of our passage. Now the people were waiting expectantly. And all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. And that was a, a legitimate concern. That was a legitimate uh, expectation. Because we, we learned last week that the, the government was corrupt. We learned last week that the religious order was corrupt. Uh, there was, there, you could hardly find anyone of integrity around. And so if they saw somebody coming out of the wilderness after 30 years in camel hair and, and eating uh, locusts and wild honey, and he's saying, repent, turn, and he's talking about the kingdom of God, that would probably be uh, the idea. You would probably say, well, could this be, could this be the Messiah? And so here's what John the Baptist bu- does. He, um, first off, put that nip it in the bud. Remember that from Barney Fife? Anybody? How many of you are... Um, Okay, we're going to have to play it again because i got to hear it and we got to turn it up. But anyways, um, how, many, how many of you know Barney Fife? Oh, there you go. And this is my Ste- Stephanie's favorite show. Sometimes I come home at lunchtime and she's got it playing on Netflix. You know, where's she, wherever she's at. But I remember this. I remember watching this the very first time. Go ahead, play, par- play Barney again. I say this calls for action and now nip it in the bud. Yeah, nip it in the bud. And that's exactly what John the Baptist does. There's your multimedia of the day. Um, but he also does this, uh, he does this multiple times. When they say, oh, he must be the Messiah, he nips it in the bud right, right then. He'll do it in this passage. But let me take you first to John chapter 3, 28 through 30 says this. And this is John the Baptist speaking. He says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. But I have been sent ahead of him. And he who has the bride is the groom. Uh, The groom is Jesus. The bride is the church. But the groom's friend, then he's talking about himself, who stands by and listens for him, rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. Remember that started all the way back in the womb when John the Baptist was in the womb of Elizabeth and, and Jesus was in the womb of Mary that he jumped for joy For that, uh, so that the joy of mine is complete. He must increase, I must decrease. So he nips it right in the bud and says, No, I am not the Messiah. I can tell you about the Messiah or point him out, but I am not the Messiah. Now, now back to our passage of scripture, he's going to handle this again. So John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. Three things here. He, first off, he addresses them all. He doesn't say this just to a, a small amount of people. Everybody he tells this to. He tells them this fact that he is not the Messiah. Second thing, he's going to give a distinction between his baptism and Jesus' baptism. There's a difference between the two that's there. And then he also gives the distinction that Jesus is more powerful than he is and he is coming. Three things he puts in there. Then if we go to the next sentence, 16b... I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. Now, if you came into a Jewish home, a a well-to-do Jewish home, and uh, you would come in, and there would be servants there. And some servants would take your cloak, and some servants might take your bag, or something like that. But there would be the lowest servant on the totem pole would be come down, and he would untie your sandals. He would take your sandals off your feet, and maybe even wash your feet kind of thing. So what, what John is saying here is he is saying that in comparison to Jesus, the Messiah, he's beneath the lowest servant on the staff. He said, that's how far I am from the Messiah. And then verse 16c, he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He gives the distinction between the two. One outcome is the Holy Spirit. When Jesus baptized... You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You receive the Holy Spirit. So in Acts 2.38, this is Peter's preaching after Pentecost, after he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's explaining this to the, the large crowd. He says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, John the Baptist was baptizing that they might 
they're confessing and they're repenting and receiving forgiveness of their sins. When Jesus baptized, when you're baptized in Jesus' name, when, you, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you, you receive the Holy Spirit from him. And then the next thing that happens is he says another outcome is fire. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. And, and this is a common theme in the Old Testament when it talks about the coming Messiah and when they talk about him, that there's this fire. This is just one sampling, Malachi 4.1. It says, for look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. There's a division that comes because of Jesus, either of Holy Spirit or of fire. So John the Baptist goes a little bit farther, explaining this in verse 17. In verse 17, he says, his winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor. That word clear there means he's going to cover the whole threshing floor. Not going to miss anything on this clearing. To gather the wheat in his barn and the chaff, he will burn with fire that never goes out. Now, let me show you this next slide here. It, John gives a great wood picture here. And here's, here's it happening right here. He's got a winnowing shovel there. You'd have all the grain would be in the center of the floor or the hard surface that was there. You would take your shovel and you would flip it into the air. Hopefully there would be a little bit of a breeze. When that grain went up, the shaft would blow away and down would come the heavy grain. And it says he cleared the whole threshing floor. He's not going to miss any portion whatsoever. And he keeps throwing it up and throwing it up and throwing it up. And pretty soon he will end up with just grain, just pure grain and in, in there. And, and where he'll scoop that up and he'll take it to his barn. Okay. But then there's going to be chaff that's going to be blown around all on the outside. He's going to do what with that? He's going to burn it. So you're either going to be barned or burned. You're going to be one or the other, barned or burned. Another thing to note that I didn't put down on your sheet, this is the first mention of hell that Luke gives us. He says, for a fire that never goes out, never goes out. See, John is just letting us see that the baptism of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, saying, I am one of them, that, that's what's going on here. And so then in verse 18, he goes on to say, then, along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Uh, just a note here, John is ministering about six months before Jesus appears. And then John continues another six months while Jesus is ministering. So at a, there's a six months where John's over here, repent and be baptized. Jesus is over here, repent and be baptized. And then Luke speeds ahead. He wants us to get to Jesus, so he tells us, Almost like the synopsis of John the Baptist's life here. He says, but when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to everything else. He locked up John in prison. So Luke jumps ahead here. Uh, Josephus, who was a first century uh, Jewish historian, tells us that he was locked up in Fort Macareras. Um, it had two dungeons there, but it was also the place where Herod, it would be Herod Antipas, uh, had a summer home there because there were hot springs there. And, and Herod would be in there the summer, and he would bring John the Baptist out every once in a while uh, to listen to him, and then he'd put him back down in the prison. But look at what John does here. He points out personal sin. You know, he's been telling everybody, repent and be baptized. But then when he sees Herod, he points right at him. You have sinned. And he, and he made known what it was. One of them is that you're with your brother's wife. Now, if you're with your brother's wife, what would that be called? Adultery. And uh, if you, it, the rest of the story, if you've not ever heard the rest of the story, is that here is Herod, supposed to be the leader of his people. He goes and takes his brother's wife. That means both these couples, these two couples here, because he was already married, um, get divorced. And then he marries his brother's wife. 
It's interesting how Luke says it's his brother's wife. It's like, wait a minute, this, this, is, not your, this is not marriage, this is adultery is what he's saying. And, and, then, and then so they move in together. She, Herodias, has a daughter named Salome, not their daughter, but her daughter. And during a uh, party, a wild party that Herod was having for himself, she sends in Salome to dance for him. And she dances quite well. All I'll say is he was very excited about her dance. So much so that he turns and says, I'll give you half of the kingdom. And young Salome runs back to Herodias and says, what do I ask for? What do I ask for? What do I ask for? And Herodias, who hated John the Baptist because she hated any, anybody that would point a finger at her and say, you've done something wrong. She says, John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's what I want. So she runs back to Herod and says, John the Baptist's head on a silver platter. And, and he dropped, he's like, oh, he didn't want to do that. He knew there was something holy about John the Baptist. But because he was in a whole crowd of people, and because he had said that, he gave the order and off with his head. So that's, what, I mean, Luke jumps over all of that to get to Jesus. He wants you to get to Jesus he speeds up so that you would get there. So John the Baptist has been beheaded. Then he backs up to verse 21 to the event today. When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Um, I love that song, um, it, when it comes into the room. That's what reminded me of this this morning. It, you, just, you have to kind of picture this. Um, so... Here's the Jordan River, and here's John the Baptist right here. And there's just a whole line of people coming down. It said all of Jerusalem came down to see him. So they're all lined up, probably single file kind of thing. And they're, it's kind of like clockwork, you know. They're coming before him, and he's saying, uh, and they say, I'm a sinner. I confess my sin. And he, boom, he dunks them under and says, you are forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. It's not that he is forgiving the sins. It, they are doing what God says to do to be forgiven of sins. So there's a, boom, they're down. And then and the next one would come and boom, they would come down. Next one would come, boom. But here's Jesus in line. Jesus is coming, <laughs> you know. And he gets up here and it, the line stops. And, and the line's getting longer behind him because they have a conversation that's going on. And the line gets longer and somebody in the back's probably going, hey, what's going on? Come on, I've been waiting all day, you know. But, but John, and, John and Jesus have this conversation going on and, and John goes, uh, wait a minute, I think we need to switch roles. I mean, why don't you stand over here? I'll stand over here, you know, kind of thing. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. No, I need to, I need to be baptized. I need to be baptized. Um, it just happened that Jesus was in that, that. That's a picture of the Jordan River there. And there's many people today that go to Israel and get baptized in the Jordan River. It's a very special thing that happens there. And then what happens when Jesus is baptized? It says, as he was praying, Jesus was praying, heaven opened, and the heavy, Holy Spirit descended on him in physical appearance like a dove. Now, Luke will mention Jesus' prayer life in chapters 3, 5, 6, 9, 11, 22, and 23. He probably wants you to see that Jesus prayed. If there's any reason for you to pray, it's because your, heavenly, your, your Savior prayed. And so you're following suit on that. Isaiah 42, 1 says, God is speaking. This is my servant speaking about the Messiah. I, I strengthen him. This is my chosen one, my Messiah. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. And he will bring justice to the nations. What's happening when Jesus comes before John the Baptist to be baptized is John was given a sign by God. He was given a sign by God. Um, if we go back, Zechariah was given a sign um, from Gabriel. Uh, I didn't mean back there. I mean, I'm going back. Yeah. Um, sign from Gabriel that uh, he wouldn't be able to speak until John the Baptist was born. And then Mary was given a sign that her cousin Elizabeth was six months long pregnant uh, with a child who was once called barren. And then the shepherds were given a sign. You will find the babe wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And then Simeon was given a sign. He was given the sign that you will not die until the Messiah is born. And now John is given a sign 
and we see it here in John 1, 33 and 34. It says, I didn't know him. Yeah, and he wouldn't. He went into the wilderness after he was born. He went into the wilderness for 30 years. And, and he lived down here. And Jesus lived about 80, 90 miles away in a little tiny town called Nazareth kind of thing. And they may have never met each other. I didn't know him. But he who sent me, God who sent me to baptize with water, told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then John says, John the Baptist says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So that was a sign to John the Baptist when he saw that happen. Jesus praying, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, the voice from heaven that we'll read next. The voice from heaven that's there. That was a sign to him to say, this is the one. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we have the baptism of Jesus. In the next verse there, the last part of that verse, a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now these are some of the greatest verses of the Trinity. I know sometimes we struggle with that concept. But this is, these are some of the greatest verses of the Trinity because it shows that as he was praying, here's Jesus praying, as he was praying, the Holy Spirit was descending, as he was praying, Holy Spirit was descending, while the Holy Spirit's descending and he is praying, the heavens open and there's a voice that comes from heaven that says, this is my son. The three in one simultaneously, simultaneously happening. He is praying, Holy Spirit descending, voice from heaven. Boom, boom, boom. There's a, there's a thought that has, is as old as old can be called modalism. And that is that, yeah, we have one God, but he has three different modes. And sometimes he's God the Father, and sometimes he's God the Son, and sometimes he's God the Holy Spirit. You know, it's whatever mode is needed. Um, But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that at times, all three of them simultaneously are there together as one God. I just gave that to you because it's in the passage of Scripture there. And maybe that will help you uh, understand that a little bit better. To see that simultaneously they can work. But there's still just one. But I want to end with this. Um, What's the importance of Jesus' baptism? What's the importance of Jesus' baptism? Number one, it's identification. Identification. Here is the sin bearer. And the sin bearer is alongside of sinners. Um, if you can even just picture him in line. And as he's, he, he is without sin. And he's got a sinner in front of him. And a sinner behind him. And sinners all around him. Probably they're all around the place. And, and he is identifying with them. As he is taking the same steps that the sinners are taking. Same steps. Number two is that we have a God like none other. We have a God like none other. We have a God who comes into our world. Actually, he created our world, but he comes into our world. And we have a God who teaches us, who gives us words to study and to understand, to apply. He's a God also that touches us, that has compassion on people, and and, and touches our hearts. And we have a God who sacrifices He sacrifices his very life, his very son on the cross. And then we have a God who verifies. He verifies. He verifies that this is my son. We actually have God's words that are there. The third thing is, is he starts where he ends. He's in a line of sinners for the baptism of repentance. And he ends up on a cross. Dying for the forgiveness for our sins. Taking our place that's there. So it doesn't change. He starts off his ministry all about repentance. And he ends his ministry what? All about repentance. Number four, God identifies him. I think this is important that we realize that God spoke. We don't know who heard this. We don't know if it was just Jesus that heard this. Or maybe just Jesus and John the Baptist that heard this. Or did everybody hear this? We don't know that. But, but he identifies and he gives us his very words, God testifying that this is the Son of God. And then the last one, number five, is a question back to us. Is 
do you identify with him? I mean, he identifies with you. He went to great lengths to identify with you. Do you identify with him? Do you, do you avail yourselves to come into a place with other people to worship him, to lift up his name? Do you, do you come to those places? Do you, do you teach his words? Do you use his words? Do, you, do you, you pull out this scripture passage that directly identifies with it? Do you, do you teach him? Do you, do you, are you have a touch of him? That when you see something, your heart is pulled by him to do something about it. To be able to touch another child of God. Um, do, you, do you sacrifice for him? Do you realize that it's really not my will, but it's his will? And so sometimes, boy, I tell you, that means a great uh, wounding to your reputation, but it doesn't matter because all, the only reputation that you care about is God's reputation and glory to him. Do you sacrifice for him? And lastly, do you verify him? When you have the opportunity, do you say Jesus' name? When you have the opportunity and it's given to you, do you, do you say that's because of Jesus or I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? Uh, unashamedly, um, he is my Savior and my Lord. So the question this morning is, do you identify with him? He is identifying with us. He does it in multiple ways. Are you identifying with him? Are you identifying with him? So the way we're going to close out our service this morning is I just want us to set uh, Jason and and say, or Jason, I say Sam, I say that so many times. Um, Jason and Stephanie are going to play a song. They're going to sing it to you. It's called Tremble. And I just want you to listen to the words that are there. I also want you to take the time and pray, do I identify with Jesus Christ? Do I truly identify with him? Because he's identified with me.